Hello and welcome to Spirit Sherpa, the show that helps and encourages you on your journey to unlock your magic mojo. I'm Jules, your co-host. If you're new to this type of work, please start with episode one. Intermediate students, go and start with episode 98. And advanced students, fast forward all the way to 200. With me as always to share her insight and wisdom is the spirit doctor herself, Kelly Sparta. What's up, Kelly? Hey, Jules. Yeah, so it's it's still Panama and we're still protesting. So <laughs> it's protesting which, Panama. Yeah, dun, dun, dun. Is, you know, <laughs> not surprising since we recorded the last episode 10 minutes ago. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, little details. It's fine. Um, but the uh, so I do want to remind you guys because it's been a whole week <laughs> since you heard this. But Heather, my assistant, is on Walkabout, and if you would like to host her as a pilgrim in your house, or if you would like to meet her for coffee or a meal or whatever, um, she is going to be going all over the U.S. Uh, and, and dipping into Canada at some point as well as her plan, although, you know, oh, nice. the world's going to actually take her. But, you know, she currently has this loose idea that she might do that. So uh, if, if you would love to host a, a spiritual pilgrim in your house or, uh, you know, visit with them, uh, I, I was told when I was the spiritual pilgrim that it was a profound experience to spend time with someone who was on that journey. And, uh, you know, that's not surprising because they're carrying the energy of the, uh, the transformation. I mean, when you're on walkabout, what, what's happening is you're letting go of everything and you're stepping out in faith. You're literally taking that leap of faith. And so you carry that energy with you. And so anybody who hosts a, a pilgrim gets some of that energy juiced into their lives. And so if you're somebody who literally can't do that because you've got kids or you've got a job that won't let you travel or what, whatever, whatever, this is a great way to get a little bit of that juice in your life. So if you're interested in that, reach out to Heather at kellysparta.com and uh let her know that you're interested in connecting with her on her journey and uh you know I, well, i'm sure we'll have her on the show at some point to talk about how the journey's going because you know that's just too much fun not to do so yeah that would be very exciting right and it's interesting because you know i did my walkabout in 2002 and she's doing hers now so well 2000 was it 2000 2001 to 2002 yeah mm -hmm. so yeah, or, yeah, somewhere around there. Yeah, most of 2002. It doesn't really matter. But yeah, she's doing it like 10, 20 years later, right? So that's pretty cool. So I'm excited to see where her journey takes her. So Yes, anyway, indeed. But, that's fun. Yeah. So because we shot the shit earlier, I don't really have much else to say. So we're just going to get straight to our guest today. Um, and I, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about her before she comes on. I, the first thing I want to say is that she has been scheduled to be on this podcast for like a year or a year and a half. And at first it was so, so we actually, we schedule a lot in advance. So six to nine months in advance. And I think when she first came in, she was like the last person in the door when I was doing all of the, the scheduling for the next nine months. And so she ended nine months out. And then I think I got sick or she got sick or somebody. We've had to postpone like two or three times. And each time it gets bumped out by months because I have to find a spot in the calendar for her. And so, you know, she gets the, the prize for the most stick to itness <laughs> and not just saying, screw this, I'm done. Right. So, so, uh, so we'll just say that she's, she's very patient. So uh, her name is Riss, Rissa Miller, and she's an editor, an author, an herbalist, a seer, and a storyteller. Uh, her storytelling expertise stems from extensive research into the area of esoteric history, including ghosts, witchcraft, cryptids, which is something we haven't talked about yet, and folklore. Rissa believes that the most enduring stories teach us not only about humanity's past, but also give us reason to reflect on our own present beliefs and realities. She often leads ghost tours and gives lively history talks. Uh, it's rare to find Rissa without tea, which is, you know, super helpful in this episode since we are talking about you know, reading tea leaves. 
Uh, and no matter where, where she is or what she's doing, that mug of green tea is her constant companion. Uh, tea is one part of her love of plants. She holds a deep reverence for plants and the answers they offer, whether as tassiographs, which is, tassiomancy is the art of reading tea leaves. So tassiographs in a teacup, smoke in the air, a healing salve for the skin, a plant on the windowsill, or nourishment for the body. In addition to adoring teas and herbs, her love of plants is made complete by the fact that she's a vegan of 28 years, and she's also a published author and poetess and has had several plays produced in the Mid-Atlantic area. So, wow. Hello, girlfriend. How you doing? Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Thank you so much for having me. And yes, I am very patient. That is definitely a word people use to describe me. But, you know, I think anything worth having is worth working for and waiting for. So I don't I don't mind the patience. Awesome. Well, we're glad you finally made it onto the show. We're super happy to have you here. Um, So so tell us how you got into Tassiomancy. Quite by accident, I got into Tassiomancy. I (laughs) so, you know, learning it and doing it were two different processes in my life. I stumbled into it as a teenager. I grew up in a small town in Pennsylvania, and uh, my mom, that year for the holidays, gave me loose tea in a tea ball, and it was a very high-value gift to me. It was exotic. It was super classy, and I, I felt very English as I was sipping my tea from a teacup with a tea ball. Well, the tea ball was actually a total piece of crap, and it broke the first time I used it. And um, I don't know if you've ever experienced those little wooden, I'm sorry, metal tea balls that they used to sell. They break all the time. They, yes. I, I don't know who makes these, but they're totally a waste. Anyhow, it broke and the gift was so high value and the tea was so wonderful. I, I drank it anyway. It didn't matter to me that the leaves were loose in the cup. I, I wasn't going to just throw it out. Um, and then as I was drinking down in the cup, feeling very fancy, I said to my mom, this looks like a cat this design on the inside of the cup with the tea leaves. And she said, you know, that's a kind of divination. What else do you see? And as I drank the cup down, I didn't know anything about tassiography at that moment. Um, I saw a basket of flowers. And then of course I just saw at the bottom, a big wad of tea, but um, I taught myself symbols from my own teacups. And at that time, this was 30 years ago, uh, there was no internet, there was no Google, I couldn't look this up. And my local library in this tiny town had nothing about Tassiography or Tassiomancy in in their collection. There was one book that existed at the time uh, that was written in the 1800s, but it wasn't available to me. So I developed my own system. I learned my own way. And in a spiral bound notebook, I drew pictures of the things I saw. But it's a two-step process, right? First, you have to be able to see the pictures, and then you have to be able to understand them. Right. And so seeing them came first. And, you know, as much as I would credit my mom for starting me on that path, I would credit my father for teaching me scrying. So this falls into the family of scrying, where you're gazing at something, right? Um, I, I also do smoke scrying. I've done water scrying. Anytime you're gazing at something and finding patterns and symbols, it's the same process. My dad, when I was a little girl, um, we would do a game called scribble art and um, (laughs) we would each take a blank piece of paper, close our eyes and just scribble all over it and then trade and look for pictures in the chaos. This is what taught me to be able to see tea. It, people always like, you make this look so people like you make this look so easy. I'm like, well, I've literally been doing it since I was three in one way or another. And so, yeah, it's pretty easy for me. (laughs) Um, it's like a second reading, a second language to me that is natural. So my dad went to art school. He had an art background and, you know, we initially did it with crayons over time. We moved up to colored pencils and markers and ink and, um, my dad is still around. He's 78 now, and we still do scribble art sometimes. I, I actually could sh- I could show you one. This is one of my dad's scribble arts. Oh, there you go. See, this is it's this a bird. Is an invitation for those of you listening on the audio to go over to the YouTube channel so you can see it. 
So. so, yeah. And, you know, it's a process that I have shared with my students. It's a process I have shared with just about anybody who will give it a try. I think it's a wonderful way to develop your intuition, to allow your um, analytical mind to sort of change over to a different way of seeing. And um, the scribble art's a great activity for kids, but it's a great activity for adults, too. And, you know, when I've taught classes using it, people are amazed how much they know from looking at somebody else's scribbles. And it, it's just, it's a really fun process and it is a great way to learn scrying. So I, um, I learned scrying as a kid. I learned tea leaf reading um, as a teenager and I've been doing it ever since. Um, sometimes more, sometimes less. Over the years, books came out on the subject and I would get them and I'd be like, this isn't how I do it. You know, and then I thought, maybe I'm doing it wrong. Maybe there's a right way. And, you know, if it works, <laughs> you do it the right way. <laughs> my way works for me. And, uh, you well. know, I've, yeah. I've taught it to many hundreds of people now as well. And, you know, I, I don't know that it works for everybody, but I, it works for me. It works for the folks who are my querents, my seekers. And um, drawing the objects is still part of my process. So, for those who can see this conversation, I'm going to show a few of my drawings. Okay, so that's so I draw the inside of the teacup, right? Yep, I draw the inside of the teacup. I draw all of the symbols that show up there. I draw the areas of confusion. I mark out the areas that are inverse. And um, I have some others, and they're all very, you'll see, you'll oh, notice wow. quickly, they're all very different. Wow. I see horses. I see a crab. Yes, there's dinosaur. a fish. Yes, yes, he's on a wobble board. And uh, there's a, a fish skeleton. There's somebody sitting at a desk on this one, an anchor. And um, these are on some smaller pages, but, you know, nonetheless the same. Yeah. Wow, you, you really know how to draw. Look at that horse. Wow, oh. no kidding. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I, I did. I studied art and art history in college, so um, they were among my areas of study. So, yes, oh, I a do. a dinosaur. Yeah, yeah, a lot of dinosaurs come up. That's a common symbol. So, um, different dinosaurs. Sometimes they're T Rexes, sometimes I get Baronosauruses, sometimes I get Stegosauruses. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, there's dinosaurs are usually someone from the past coming back and it's your job now to resolve what was left undone, at least in my symbol language. So yeah. to okay. briefly to briefly explain, my symbol language is my own and I started creating it as a teenager. I started intuiting what the symbols meant to me and I, I kept a notebook for a long time. Over the many years of many moves, I've sadly lost that treasure. But uh, it's all retained in my brain, and mostly I've typed a lot of those notes out now. But um, I did add to it with art history and literature and studying specifically, you know, um, Asian astrology symbols and uh, Native American symbols and things that I wanted to specifically add to my language of symbols. And, you know, there are still things that come up that I, I don't know what they are. Um, and sometimes they mean something to that person. You know, the example I love to give is uh, one time I was reading a young lady's cup and I was looking at it and there was a Sasquatch with a guitar, like a Bigfoot. And I thought, well, I must be overtired or maybe I need to eat like something's wrong. But, you know, I decided to trust what I saw. And I said to her, I said, does a Sasquatch with a guitar mean anything to you specifically? She just lit up. She said, yeah, that's my boyfriend. He is in a band where they dress up like Sasquatches and he plays the guitar. <laughs> I, first of all, I didn't know that was a thing. I didn't know people did that. I didn't did know that. that was a thing. Yeah, I had no idea that people did. I guess whatever, if you can imagine that somebody's doing it, right? I didn't know that was a thing. Um, I definitely didn't know <laughs> that he played the guitar. Um, I, I was also thinking like, I have technical questions, but anyway, um, yeah. I, I don't, I'm not a musician. Yeah, but yeah, this is one of the I, things that we talk about on the show all the time is this idea that you need to develop your own symbolic language with spirit, that everybody yes. has a unique one to them, and that understanding the symbologies of the things that are around you, that, that are in your culture or in cultures that you connect to, 
that those can help you to inform your own language, but they, you know, ultimately you're creating your own re relationship with spirit through that mm -hmm. language of symbology and mythology and metaphor, right? Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, I think that unfortunately when I'm, when I'm teaching this, there are a lot of folks looking for a shortcut. No and I think yeah. there's, it, this is one of those things that truly takes patience, but the rewards are great. So, you know, I mean, you could stick with the, just looking for 11, 11 on the clock, but there's a lot more. <laughs> If that works for you, go with you, it. No, you, but, just, you just tapped into. We, we, <laughs> we just okay, y'all, we can't make this up. We can't make no, this we, up. We did not tell her. So we, we just <laughs> an episode before you. We were talking uh -huh. about master numbers and oh. um, ascended masters. And what I said about it was, yeah, the numbers are just your guys trying to get your attention. The numbers are not relevant. Stop focusing on them. Stop paying attention to them. They aren't relevant. Stop trying to create meaning for them. They're, 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 stop it. Right. And <laughs> we can't make them. Now we know. Now we know why you had to be on this episode. <laughs> and why it was today. Right. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. We just had to stick that in there because that's hysterical. <laughs> no, that's actually perfect. Yeah. Because you can't make this up. Right. <laughs> Well, yeah, perhaps I'm, uh, I'm, I'm picking up what you're putting down. Yes, so I, I um, so. and you know, I think there are people who have personal numbers. I've had numbers show up in a cup that were things like the date a child was born or, sure. you know, wow. yeah, the different. door number, yeah. things like yeah. that. And it, I'm not a numerologist. I'll always tell people that, like, I know just enough to be dangerous. So, um, <laughs> Yeah, just, just, just this much, but you know, I always am honest, like if I don't know, I'll tell you, I, I just don't know. But you know, for me, um, symbols can come as numbers, but more often they come as animals or um, plants or shapes that I have to intuit and interpret. And I, I guess that's how I'm comfortable. And that's also how I learned to read symbols. And so you and I, and maybe Jewel, we, we understand how a tea reading happens. Can you explain to the people who are listening mm -hmm. exactly how mm -hmm. they go about having a tea reading? What is, how does, what does it look mm -hmm. like? What do you do? Sure. Well, there are only, there, there aren't tons of us in the world, even there's, there's only a handful of us and a lot of us do know each other. So, you know, the other thing I'm going to tell you, every tea leaf reader is different. Um, I'm, I'm good friends with a, a few of them and we read totally differently, but you know, our systems work for us. We all developed our own unique language. So you have to drink a cup of tea and I mean a cup of tea, not a mug of tea. So, uh, this doesn't work with a mug. The mug is, has long sides and a squared bottom and the tea just lays in clumps in that corner on the bottom. So that will, that will not be a thing. Yeah. That won't work out for you. Um, a mug is what I usually drink my personal tea from in the morning. Um, I'm not a coffee drinker. Uh, you can do this with coffee. You can do this with cacao. Also not my thing, but um, I like tea. So okay, I, so like my, my little cup, would this be a good cup or not a good cup? Your cup is too deep. Uh, it would be really okay. difficult to see that far into the cup. So this cup that I have is a perfect example. This is where you get to pretend that, you know, you're on um, BBC and having your proper British tea, right? Yes. I'm not British. I have no British history at all in my family. Uh, Scottish, yes, but not British. Anyway, I still love it. So the tea needs this nice curved bottom and a shallow bowl. I do like the cups with handles. The very old teacups don't have handles and the Asian teacups do not have handles. And I can read those. I do it differently. So um, if that's important to you, I'll explain it. But you drink the whole cup of tea and the tea has to be, I'm trying to do this without spilling. The tea, the tea has to be loose in the cup. Now, okay. I prefer to read black tea. It's not my favorite drinking tea. I usually drink green tea as my drinking tea. But black tea creates a really nice contrast and it's easy to see. And as I've gotten on an age, it's been easier for me to see it. So uh, I do keep a magnifying glass handy. Um, I, you know, like I Sherlock Holmes it if I need to. But um, so the next step is turning the cup. This is the trickiest part for the whole of the whole process for the querent. So I use a uh, paper towel. 
some people use a cloth napkin and some people don't use anything. But I want to tell you that the sound of porcelain scraping on porcelain just, <laughs> it makes my spine feel uncomfortable. So uh, I don't care for that. I use a buffer. So uh, I don't want to knock down my mic, but I want to show you how I do this. So is, this isn't a little moment like this. This is a great big moment like this. I need a little more space than I can do above the, above the mic. I make either a big circle. It doesn't matter to me if they're circles or people shake it up and down or zigzags. There are readers that say it has to be nine circles to the right or left. I, I feel like after my years of doing this, um, I've even had querents who physically couldn't make circles because of shoulder injuries and things like that. And so I, I'm like, move it however it feels good to you. It just needs to be a big enough movement to get the tea on the sides of the cup. And then you invert it like that. You can see that the, um, the paper towel is wet. So the leftover tea sort of comes out. Ooh, this is an interesting cup. So this is what it looks like. That's what this one looks like. Okay. Yeah, it looks like a whole and I can actually, I could take a picture. Yeah. I could take a picture if you want to um, see it uh, that way and, and send it to you as well. That great. you could drop in. You put it on the cover of the episode. So yep. Be good. You got it. That that would be cool. Yeah. Like so, when, when, when I'm looking down in it, it looks, it looks like you're looking at continents. It does. You know, just, just with like the big <laughs> land masses, but then the little bitty islands. Um, this one does look a little bit like that, but as you can tell from my drawings, they're all very different. And I you know I didn't, I didn't pull this cup over with any intention except to show you a cup. So it's not like I was, you know, I will do a magical reading that will be appropriate for all your listeners. No, I didn't do that. <laughs> um, but, uh. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a there's a nice size question mark in here. There's a, an interesting spiral. There's a rabbit. There's a Nubian statue. There's a hatchet. There's a <laughs> there's a microscope. There's all kinds of as an old fashioned telephone. There's all kinds of stuff going on in there. So when I'm reading a cup for someone, the next thing I do, I start at the handle because most people hold their teacup by the handle. That's where they leave their strongest impression of who they are. So. Uh, I start there and I'm like, this is what you're experiencing right now. Like, this is where we are in the moment. And then I move into the side of the cup that I mark as the emotional side of the cup. I feel like people's emotional state really colors how they see their material world. So I place a little more emphasis on the emotional side of the cup. And, and then I read, the cup. I'll show you on my drawing. Okay. It's this side. <laughs> So it's the side to the left of the handle as you're looking down. Yes. Yes. That's correct. All right. So, yes. Okay. Wait, no, no. It's the side. Well, if the handle is upward, it's the side to the. It's backwards on your screen. If I'm holding the cup by the handle, the emotional side is on the left. If I'm holding it by the handle, the material side is on the right. Yeah. It just depends on which way you're holding the cup, I guess. Okay. But so by the handle. Yes. Correct. It's on the left. By the handle and looking down, then the mm -hmm. emotional is on the left and the material yes. is on the right. Okay. All yes. Right. That's it. Just like with your brain. Laughing, so I, they're like, no, you yes. you got to tell us which side. So, okay. Now we know. Okay. <laughs> So yeah, and again, uh, no tea leaf reader I know reads the same way I do. Uh, they they read they this we call it mapping the cup. They map the cup differently, and that's totally fine because we all you know it's interesting. Like we've we've done experiments where like <clears throat> let's both read the same cup and we come up with the same story but with different different methods. So that's that's awesome. So I read the emotional that's side of the cool. cup. I then I read the material side of the cup. And then I put it together into a storyline. I look at the biggest symbols first because they're the, you know, going to be the most dominant, most important parts of the story. And um, then I fill in with all the little stuff that came in on the sides. The one nice thing about when I get to do readings remotely is that people send me pictures of their cup instead of me looking at the actual cup. And I can zoom in on my computer. I can zoom in like a thousand percent and see these fine details that in person I'll never see. I'll never see them. So it's, it's a nice sort of uh, bonus uh, for people who come to me remotely that they get more detail in their drawings and in their readings.
That's cool. Yeah. So you're doing this now mm -hmm. and you're, you've made up your own system, which I adore. I'm, I'm a big <laughs> fan of make up your own system because you know, you have a, you have your own connection to spirit and it, it doesn't have to be somebody else's system. Right. This is one of the things that we talk about. I'm, I'm a, I'm a hardcore like chaos magician. So <laughs> <laughs> like make shit up, man. Just like fly by the seat of your pants and make shit up. Talk to your spirit. Let them tell you what to do. Use your intuition. Mm -hmm. Don't worry about what's mm -hmm. quote unquote right. Do right. What works, right. If it works for you, then it's right. You know? Yes. And that, that's the thing. So, um, you know, this is, this is right up our alley. So, uh, okay. So uh, now I can tell that there are people going, I want a tea leaf reading. I, I want a remote yeah. reading. <laughs> so, so how do the people find you if they want to get a, a remote reading or if they want to do anything else with you? Oh, um, well, I'll answer that, but I wanted to make one quick comment on what you sure. said before. So yeah. I'm a third generation tarot reader as well, but I wasn't taught from the book. I was taught by my grandmother at her kitchen table. And I felt for the longest time that I couldn't read for others because the way I learned was inferior because learning from my grandmother and mom wasn't as good as the people who would learn from the book or from a class. I never even had the book until like in my late thirties, like, yeah. but I, I grew up with tarot cards on the kitchen table. They were totally normal part of my life. And I still refused to ever read for anybody until probably like the past five to six years because I thought, oh, the way my family did it wasn't the same. It's not, it's not the same, but it is a system that works, that is old, that has been handed down over generations in my family. And you know what? I since have read the book and I can now incorporate that too, if it feels right. But it, it does feel very different and almost uh, chaotic compared to how everybody on YouTube reads or whatever else. And, um, it is a much more intuitive system. But see, this is the thing that I tell people about all the time. We talk about this all the time. It's like the things that are most intuitive to you, the things that are most common to you, the things that you do without even thinking about are the things that you think aren't valuable, but other people think are incredibly valuable, right? So, yeah. you know, I know a ton of people who would look at you and say, oh my God, you were, you're, you're third generation or fifth generation or 20th generation tarot reader, you know, blah, blah, blah. You, you've got all this stuff from, from history and da, 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 da. And, you know, most of the stuff from the tarot has been written down by the Aleister Crowley people and, you know, from the Gardnerians tradition and stuff like that. And a lot of it's come from that. It's, it's only goes back to the fifties, right. Or maybe the twenties, if you're lucky, um, occasionally into the 1800s, but you know, if, if you've got a traditional line that goes back further than that, that's, that's amazing. Right. And, and it gives you connection into a different, uh, a lineage, right. A different, um, time. Right. And so, but these are the things that people, just like you just said, it's like, Oh, well, I didn't think I could read for people because I didn't learn the right way. Right. It's no, no, <laughs> just, 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 just do it. Right. It doesn't work. Yeah. Yes. Own it. Right. That's yeah. the thing. So yeah, I'm, I'm with you. Yeah. In yeah. Fact, I think that's yeah. Your Kellyism for the day. We're going to put it in early. If it works, own it. That is your Kellyism for the day. You know, <laughs> do it. Yeah. So how do people so help you? How people find me. My name is Rissa, R-I-S-S-A, -S -S and my website is teaandsmoke.com. Everything is there. The way to get a reading, the way to find me on Instagram or YouTube, everything is attached to teaandsmoke.com. So it's and spell, spelled out. So mm -hmm. tea and sm smoke, not an and, mm -hmm. just A-N-D. Okay, great. Yep, and all usual spellings. And you said that you were going to offer a special for my people. So I would like love to. So I will offer a special for that will run for three months from the time the show airs and it will be 20% off any reading that you want to book. Score. Run guys, <laughs> run, run, Forrest, run. Yeah. <laughs> so that sounds amazing. So, all right. Well, Rissa, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, yeah, guys, thanks for having to... me. At last. Yes, at last, right? <laughs> guys, don't forget to rate and share the show so that you can help both us and Rissa get the message out because, you know, that's 
part of why we do this is to make sure everybody gets to hear about it and learn about it. So please rate and, and uh, review and share and subscribe and all the fun things. And Rissa, we're going to invite you onto the Spirit Sherpa by Kelly Sparta Facebook group. Um, and so we'll invite Rissa into the group. She'll be in there by the time this episode airs. So if you guys have questions for her direct and you want to ask her, you can do that in the Facebook group as well. So uh, I think that's it. So Jewel, you want to take us out? I can do that. Well, that's all that we have time for this week, folks. Tune in next time when Kelly adds another chapter into your guide to energy, magic, and the spirit world. I'm Jules, here with Kelly and Rissa, and you have been listening to Spirit Sherpa. So long, y'all. Bye. Bye.